to talk to us today about public interest infrastructure coming from very different background, one in Palestinian digital activism, one in kind of Asian and Singaporean digital news media startup, and one from, from an academic perspective on kind of AI and, and public interest. So let me just uh, give you the specifics of uh, uh, bios of our attendees. Nadim uh, Nashif is uh, the so a social entrepreneur and digital rights defender. He's the founder and executive of AMLE, the Arab Center for Advancement of Social Media, which is a Palestinian digital rights organization. He's also the co-founder of Wuzui Digital Academy, a digital marketing educational center. And he's a senior policy analyst at Al Shakaba, the Palestinian Policy Network. And uh, Nadim has been in this field for, for 20 years, to an organizing with youth and, and very impressive uh, track record. So we're very pleased to have Nadim with us. Our second speaker is going to be Rishad Patel, who is a product and design professional in, and the co-founder of Splice Media. Splice Media serves the media startup community in Asia, and their mission is to drive radical change by super supporting both forward-looking media ventures. And Rishad has also over 20 years of experience designing and developing products for the web, mobile, radio, advertising, newsrooms, newspapers, magazines, and podcasts. So a very interesting profile that is also an IMS partner and someone we work with when we try to kind of reinvent and, and think of, of new things in, in the media spaces. And of course, the digital aspects of that are, are great. Finally, Teresa Suga is joining us from, from Berlin. She's the head of the Public Interest AI Research Group and also the co-lead of the AI and Society Lab at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. Her group is concerned with questions of how AI can serve the public interest and which technical and social criteria must be fulfilled for this to happen. Teresa's research focuses on the political dimensions of digital technologies and cultures, which in particular with a particular interest on in democratic theory. Her PhD focused on digital forms of civil disobedience. And then uh, I go back with all the speakers, but Teresa and I go the furthest back as we've also worked on other projects, including co-founding Bridge Figures, a human rights project in a data-driven world. So that's the lineup for today. And I'm very pleased and thank you to all three speakers for joining me. I'm really excited to see where this conversation takes us. As from my kind of side of the it, I work at international media support exactly in this space of how do we push and ask more of our digital environments. And we've come up with this term of, of public interest infrastructure in collaboration and with inspiration from a lot of great scholars and, and uh, activists out there. But saying, couldn't we ask more of our digital infrastructures? We see this dysfunction happening to our media partners of being flooded with disinformation, with hate speech. We have individual cases such as the Cambridge Analytica scandal or the Myanmar genocide, and we have a democratic backsliding. And maybe one of the con like long-term concerns we have is this privatization and monopolization of, of data knowledge and moderation by a few American and Chinese companies. And this is something that faces our partners on a daily basis, trying to do public interest journalism uh, get stories out there to to their communities, and they meet this challenge that is is not new. It's been growing for the past 20 years, but we think at this point we kind of need to move beyond just trying to fix Facebook or YouTube, and that's of course part of the, the equation as well. But couldn't we envision something better? Couldn't we, as civil society, as academia, and as tech industry? come up with a vision of something that works better and serves our communities better. That's kind of our very tall, the tall order of this panel to kind of see, can we envision some of that? And then equally important to identify some of the first steps to get there, because this is not a, a quick fix. This is a long process and we're in the very early stages of it. There's some, of course, some very fascinating different projects happening all over the world already. What can we learn from that? What can we support in those existing projects? And where do we have to Kind of incentivize and build community to to create new innovations. That that's a lot for an hour. <laughs> we're not going to get there through all of it, but but that's uh, wh what we're aiming to do. And then I think I'm just going to say one way we've approached it at IMS because it's such a big, challenging uh, undertaking is to split it into three priorities that we call damage control, diagnostics, and then ignite and scale. 
So kind of to conceptualize and acknowledge that we can't do it all at once, there's a damage control element in a lot of our work and a lot of our partners work. That is, how do you deal with the COVID uh, conspiracy theory that is penetrating your society and like, how do you stop it? And our partners are doing great work, fact checking and downgrading and working with existing infrastructures to make sure that the damage is limited at least. It's not an easy job. It takes up a lot of resources. But then we've had these other two kind of priorities put more and more in center. Like we know so little about current digital infrastructures, how they function. There's different reasons, but one is of course that the big platforms don't share that much of the data of, of these interactions. So we are simply have a hard time determining the scale and the impact of disinformation. Like we know it's a lot out there, but how exactly does it interact? How big a part of a media diet is it for an average user or a specific community user? We simply don't know. So we have an effort there journalistically, academically, and in kind of getting access to data and doing the good analysis, writing it up in both to audiences and to kind of academic perspectives and policy circles of, of like, what data do we need? How can, what can we use it for? And then that leads to the third priority based on that, what, what can we innovate and what needs to be scaled? Because there's a lot of solutions out there already. So, so some of it might simply be scaling, or which is not simple. Others might be creating innovation, which is a tall order, but nonetheless, some of what our partners, including some on this panel, are at the forefront of. So that's kind of the, the very brief introduction to international media support and our uh, approach and interest in this field. And then the whole point is actually that I shouldn't speak so much, and I'll leave the word to our great speakers that I've asked to give a short presentation about kind of where they come from into this perspective, what the challenges they see and what the kind of potential and long-term uh, opportunities are in this. And I'm very excited to ask uh, Nadim to, to go first and to take us uh, through the situation in both in Palestine, what are the immediate challenges and, and what are the longer term perspectives as, as you see it. So Nadim, the floor is yours and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you Magnus. Um, I'm happy to be with you all uh, here uh, in this important event, and uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, putting this together. Um, 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 I work as a director of Hamle. Hamle is a Palestinian digital rights organization. Uh, we work um, and we aim to defend Palestinian digital rights. And digital rights, um, as we all know, are the human rights on the online uh, sphere. We uh, want to also emphasize the whole issue of uh, freedom of expression online as uh, one of the main uh, pillars. Um, and we also um, emphasize the issue of uh, privacy uh, of the people and their data. We also emphasize the right of uh, assembly and uh, the right of people to come together and organize through the online. Um, and we want to emphasize also the issue of access uh, to internet, which is maybe obvious in some countries, but in, in other contexts, not really uh, uh, something uh, obvious and not uh, really something that is uh, happening. Uh, and in general, as organization, we look to have a a more free and fair and safe internet. Um, and this is, um, in general, what we aim for for uh, Palestinians, but we obviously aim it for generally uh, for all humanity on the net. Um, and our struggle um, is complicated in our reality to, to achieve this, uh, the same because of the complicated uh, political reality, um, because of the relationships between the companies and, and, and governments, uh, etc. We do our work in Hamle in a way that we are basically uh, monitoring and researching uh, the reality of the digital rights, the violations that are happening from the side of government. Um, uh, similarly, we uh, look and monitor the, the policies of, uh, of the different internet companies, specifically the social media companies and how they are uh, dealing uh, with the Palestinian content and narrative and generally um, and their cooperation with the government. Um, in the past years, uh, uh, in, in the Palestinian reality, again, there is more than one, uh, uh, probably you know, 
Um, so the complicated reality is that there are certain areas that uh, the local Palestinian kind of autonomous, semi-autonomous governments are controlling, and uh, in the wider picture, the Israeli government is occupying West Bank and Gaza Strip. So there are the kind of three systems at the same time, the three governments involved at the same time, which make obviously the work is more uh, complicated. But in general, the tendency. Uh, is to control the internet from all governments. Uh, I think in the past decade, and this is maybe we can speak about um, um, many areas uh, around the globe or many oppressive regimes mainly around the globe who are trying more and more to, to control it. In our region, in the MENA region, um, uh, obviously after the Arab Spring, uh, uh, there were many legislations, including uh, cyber crime legislations that happening. And unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority, um, which control uh, the main Palestinian cities in the West Bank, uh, are also have adopted this uh, this law. Um, and uh, this law comes in, in 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 general, it's criminalized activists and human rights defenders and political opponents. Um, the Hamas de facto government in Gaza Strip is also using something similar called um, uh, called the misuse of uh, technology. And in general, these regulations and legislations have a kind of uh, vague definitions of things that would allow them, again, to criminalize uh, uh, their political opponents or human rights defenders um, in a way. Uh, normally, such legislations should come in a way that to protect the citizen. Um, and the reality that's happening in many uh, places around us, these legislations are coming to protect the government from the citizens. So it's a kind of uh, uh, reverse approach. Uh, in any case, uh, the Israeli government, which is uh, the powerful uh, side of, of the game here, um, and which con still control uh, most of the areas, uh, and is occupying power in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, is also using different tactics and strategies, um, um, including denial of, of access and the denial of uh, technologies to enter to certain areas, including uh, having uh, a massive uh, spying and military operators um, using lots of technologies um, and actually developing lots of those technologies on Palestinians uh, to, to surveil, uh, including the social media, including uh, facial recognition. I don't know if some of you saw the Washington Post piece uh, that was published uh, two days ago about um, uh, having this uh, cameras of uh, facial recognition technology uh, and classifying Palestinians, uh, how much they are kind of a threat to the soldiers, etc. Um, so all of this is being developed here. But I'm, I'm speaking about the Palestinian context, by the way, but most of the things are also very re relevant to other areas because as we see, for example, in the surveillance industry, it, do, it does develop here. Lots of it is being tested on Palestinians, but later on uh, sold uh, in different countries and in different realities. Um, we know the notorious NSO company um, that started here and now selling all these technologies all over the world. Um, but beyond this, also there are regulations and uh, legislation by the Israeli government that again comes to silence and criminalize human rights activists. Uh, so this is a, a main strategy that is being uh, developed. There is also the whole issue of coordinated the efforts that's coming from governments and from governments affiliated uh, uh, or, uh, organizations and NGOs, basically to have this kind of massive reporting and coordinated reporting and spreading uh, misinformation um, uh, to uh, mainly harass uh, Palestinian human rights activists and organizations. Um, so basically, the idea is that uh, to keep uh, reporting uh, on the content of those uh, uh, people. So from one hand, you have the formal Israel or the formal cyber, the Israeli cyber unit that is in cooperation with the companies being reporting like tens of thousands annually of, of, of uh, asking for takedowns, basically, and closing accounts in the social media. And from uh, the other side, in a parallel effort, there also the whole issue of uh, groups uh, who work um, and organize around the uh, applications. And those applications send those groups uh, basically notification asking them to report certain content um, that the Israeli government don't like from uh, this or that reason. 
the result is basically that there are like tens of thousands uh, of, of, of uh, takedowns that is happening. We know from the head of the cyber unit that in 2020, they, the, the Israeli government officially asked from Facebook for takedowns of more than 20,000 requests. Um, so you can imagine how, how big the, ph the phenomena. Um, and now moving to the side of the social media companies, from their side, they are very cooperative towards the Israeli government. Um, they, uh, we, we know that uh, the level of uh, positive response from those governments to the Israeli government request is around 90% um, positively answered. So 90% they basically take down the, um, the, the post or the close the account or the page, etc. In general, when we speak with the social media companies, and especially Facebook, they speak about global policies of content moderation and terms of use, etc. And they say that they don't, do not have any kind of specific cooperation or in a level of agreement with a certain government. In practice, we all know that this is not uh, accurate and far from reality. Uh, specifically, after all the wave of leaks that happening from X. Facebook employees who have been uh, going out, speaking about the reality there, etc. The problem is that um, if, if there is a strong government that is, is there and putting pressure on those companies, they, in most of the reason, in most of the cases, would agree to those uh, pressures and, uh, and follow them. This is not only in, in the Palestinian example, this is not only happening in social media, this is also happening in, uh, for example, uh, in, in Google, with Google Maps. Um, so uh, Google Maps basically on the occupied West Bank, uh, which uh, uh, by Google, I mean, you see the, narrative, the Israeli narratives, you see the name of the settlement, uh, you, and you see a total uh, ignorer of uh, Palestinian uh, indigenous people uh, narrative on that uh, in terms of names, places, uh, etc. Also, in certain cases of uh, economical platforms, because of Israeli pressure on them, uh, what's happening basically that many Palestinians, the ones specifically ones who are living in West Bank and Gaza Strip, uh, do not have access to, uh, let's say, PayPal. Um, so if you are an Israeli settler living in the West Bank, you have access to PayPal. If you are a Palestinian citizen, you do not have a... Uh, and this come by, again, like Israeli pressure on the companies and cooperation. Generally, what's happened is that those companies have uh, different interests. The main interest is to have the market, obviously, and get the benefit of the market and uh, the financial benefit. The second interest in the Israeli case is also the whole tech industry and uh, buying uh, uh, companies and having all this technological uh, uh, ties and cooperations. Uh, and the third level normally is the size which comes to higher level with executives and Israeli politicians. Uh, again, I'm talking a lot about uh, Palestine, but you can draw the line and see also uh, in, in many other places where, for example, there are, were lots of reports around the connection between the Indian government and Facebook and how uh, the content moderation in India uh, basically silenced the Kashmiri voices. We can speak about Facebook and Myanmar and um, the disaster that happened there, the catastrophes that Facebook um, did not uh, prevent the, the incitement that was happening against uh, the Rohingya. So all of this brings us to a conclusion, basically, that we are living in a place that uh, if there is a strong government that has the money, that has the manpower, that has uh, enough political ties, enough uh, technological ties, they can maneuver and they can manipulate uh, in front of the companies to have certain voices less heard, certain narratives less being seen, um, and the narrative that they want it to be there. Um, um, so if we feel and if we want and if we want to dream about um, a free and fair and safe uh, net for everybody, um, obviously right now we are in a, in a far place than, than that, and there's lots of things that we need to do in order basically to move to a place um, that is more safe and more free for, for everybody and more equal and that you don't feel that there is a digital discrimination uh, towards certain people uh, and groups that are maybe less powerful than others 
and that there is equality also on the online because basically what we are doing is just replicating the power relationships uh, from the offline to the online. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Nadim, for a very powerful and very kind of precise example, of course, and of course the lived reality for you and all your colleagues and, and kind of community, but also of the dysfunction that we then see play out in different ways in different societies. But of course, because of, of your context, I think it, it crystallized quite, quite clear the challenges we're facing and, and the consequences that this whole idea we've had about the internet being kind of empowering, allowing uh, marginalized communities to speak up it is fundamentally challenged. And one of the issues is that if you concentrate the power to make these decisions with a few companies, that those decisions have enormous consequences for all of us and our ability to, to kind of act and just even get the information to act on. And I actually just re reminded me that I forgot in my introduction to say, and you might know since you come through, through this platform, but this is part of a Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs Tech for Democracy. That's kind of the overall kind of conversations we're having, how can tech actually contribute to democracies and to democratization rather than undermine it. And I think if you can't hear from the most marginalized communities, then <laughs> there's, there's a long way to go, right? So, so I'm really, Grateful, Nadim, for, for placing us in, in this kind of conversation. And then I want to flip it to Richard in, in Singapore, who has promised to give kind of a, a vision of like, what could we actually ask? What can we reimagine some of this? What would a more kind of constructive public interest, people centered approach look like? Or are there elements out there in his own work and in other places that we can be inspired from? So with that, Rashid, I will turn it to you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Magnus. And thank you, Nadine, for that inspiring uh, uh, capture of exactly what was going on uh, in, in Palestine and similar geographies. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Hopefully, I share the right screen. Uh, let me know if you see a, a, a slide That's with right. big pink text on it. Uh, yes. Because Hello, I Richard. can't. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to quickly take you through this, this uh, presentation of mine. Um, so we're Splice. I'm one half. I'm the guy on the left. My co-founder is Alan Soon. Um, and we're based in Singapore. Uh, the idea is for us to be at the center of media transformation in Asia. And we want to do that by working with the global media ecosystem. Uh, journalists, grantors, funders, uh, technologists, big tech, small tech, little tech, data, um, to support and celebrate these wonderful media startups that we work with in Asia. Uh, but this presentation really is about a, a slightly weird juxtaposition. Um, and it starts with a little article I read in the New Yorker a couple of years ago. And it got me and this article was about Estonian digital uh, governance, this decentralized digital governance that they had, have set up. And it led me to think about a project we had done in Myanmar with the Burmese newsroom. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what can an Estonian governance system and a Burmese newsroom uh, teach us about public interest infrastructure? And so this is a very quick explanation exploration of this technology that results in you know uh technology asking different different uh it's different component bits is everything okay with you um and so let's focus on the estonian governance bit of it what was the threat there it was russian military and digital interference i'm vastly simplifying here as many of you know uh the answer to that threat was e estonia uh and the exciting thing here is that all government services, legislation, voting, all the pillars of government and, and obviously democracy are all digitally linked across one highly decentralized platform. Now this can ring alarm bells in a lot of uh, people's, people's heads because that, you know, this is a, but it's actually a refreshing counterpoint to say how the US and other, other governments do it. Nadim himself mentioned in his in his presentation uh that governments control the internet right and that that digital legislation uh protects governments not people 
and of course the us and other counterparts we think of tech and government services um you know where where data architecture is decent it's very centralized it's very basic uh, it is used to protect the government and not the people and it's also brokered out to a few people who actually hold the reins of power like facebook and google and gang uh the exciting thing here in in estonia was to take the same tech uh, uh you know loosely speaking and flip it around so people own their data and their rights to their data not institutions and i was excited to read this that you know an estonian owns all her information she also owns all access to that information so if the health minister looks at her medical information uh she a has to allow it and b she can see that digital glance um regardless of whether it's you know uh, crossing borders visa issues law and order issues financial whatever it might might uh might involve and that's an exciting idea um in fact one of the uh, lovely quotes from the articles article was we don't have big brother we have little brother and we beat him up once in a while and tell him what to do and i thought that was an interesting way to look at how the technology actually works it isn't so much the tech uh but it's that mindset of what that tech allows you to do as a society it's that perhaps that digital uh culture i love that in the internet of things basically the, the lamp post is wired to the other lamp post which is checking if that's okay which is looking to see if the road is okay the pedestrians are fine which also speaks to your car and makes sure everything's fine in in relation to all the other traffic uh such a great model and it comes back to uh your we're using technology to check with with each other uh, we're saying hey is everything okay with you and so i wanted to jump this across to a project we did with um a newsroom in Yangon, Myanmar, that we're very close to. Let's look at this as a parallel. Frontier, Myanmar, um, they had their ongoing threat. And because this is uh, slightly over a couple of years ago, uh, the threat then was not just lack of advertising and a dwindling market, uh, but COVID was on the brink of arriving and of course there was a little matter of a military coup so we huddled with our friends in in yangon and you know went went to their office and said let's set this reader revenue program up for the community and and an interesting uh tip on you know how to how to set up a community um of course uh in, in for media is to discover that in order to set up a membership program, you need a community, but you, it was lovely to discover that they already had one. Uh, these folks were members, not because they wanted to buy products, uh, not because it was a transact uh, transactional relationship between the organization and them, but because they supported Frontier's mission. And that mission very clearly was to tell the story of Myanmar uh, as publicly uh, as possible for advocacy. And so how do you launch a membership program? you ask these potential members what they want. We thought that would be the best, best way. So we gathered everybody over lots of cups of beautiful tea and biscuits and said, hey, what do you guys think? Uh, we're thinking of this, do you want that? Uh, they shot down all our fancy ideas for Slack channels and you know, uh, conference calls and, and all kinds of things. And they said, you know, they gave us what they wanted from, uh, from Frontier. And it kind of felt like we were the world's most ideal uh, parliament or, or government, for example, uh, trying to launch programs for this country of country of frontier, you know. And we we had the people decide and vote actually all the different personas over um, many days of what they what their kind of what their legislature should be, what their programs should be, and how much they wanted to pay for it in terms of wealth membership fees or taxes it felt like a state and its people looking out for each other in this way of saying hey is everything okay with you and they continue to do that this day i'm happy to report and it's not in my data but i'm happy to report that this is now how frontier makes its uh money 
case is how it pays its rent and, and salaries. And it's doing really well. And the members are very much a part of this, the government of that media organization. Um, these are successful systems of self-governance and they're supported by uh, public infrastructure. But it does take an ecosystem. We can't do this uh, alone. Um, they couldn't do it alone. Um, and, and I'm interested in you know, how, how we replicate this infrastructure, as Magnus said. How do we replicate this in our public systems? How do we codify that intent and that mindset that, hey, I'm looking out for you. Um, and we're kind of, we see ourselves as that at Splice. Uh, Splice, again, is a two-man organization. Uh, but we, again, work with this global infrastructure uh, and glo the global media ecosystem, much like uh, you know, with folks like IMS. Uh, and we partner with them uh, to be that central plumbing that perhaps the media ecosystem needs. In a way, we're asking them, hey, you know, how are you doing? Is everything okay? How can we help? Um, is everything okay with you? And that's it. That's it for me. Thank you thanks so much, for, Rish. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Richard. Very inspiring, and, and I'm always intrigued by your ideas, and they generate so many other good ideas and many good takeaways. I love the operationalization to boil it down to the question, are you okay? Like for all the complexities of public interest, right? That's that's a, the question, so to say. But another person to help us answer that is, is Teresa, that I'm very happy to join for many reasons, and I have long collaborations with Teresa, but in particular her her current role is really intriguing to me, and I see such a need for, for us at, as civil society to engage more with, with academia because some of these questions are not easily answered. A lot of our partners and ourselves are in this kind of damage control setting and mode most of the time because so many things are happening that we need to react to and take care of our communities. And so our ability to kind of think long term is, is challenged on a daily basis. And of course, it's not easy being an academic either, but there's sometimes a little more room to kind of think ahead and, and put up some structures and ideals. And Teresa is one of the leaders of that in the field of, of, of public interest AI. So Teresa, I'm really excited to leave the word to you and hear what you have to say from Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm uh, already enjoying this session a lot. And I think that we actually do have a lot to connect on which is already a good start <laughs> because um, the first important thing um, maybe uh, to say about public interest, um, I'm a political theorist and so I'm also very much interested in like what this concept actually is, what we know about it so far. Uh, and there is, I think, one strong connection that we can take through all the inputs that we heard is that public interest is something very context dependent. So it's never something universal that can be defined. So there will never be like one infrastructure that we can say to be in the public interest for all times. But actually, um, it is something that is, uh, and that is something maybe that uh, philosophers like John Dewey told us in their theories that we have to define over and over again in a participatory process, in a process of deliberation. And that also holds true for technology, I think. But uh, what I like about the term and about the idea of public interest is um, that we do have a tradition, a long tradition in, in, in theory, so in the ways we think about politics, but also a long tradition in many legislations, uh, like in the um, data protection uh, in Europe, uh, public interest is mentioned 70 times in that one big law. Uh, but we also have a tradition in actual lawmaking, uh, um, and jurisdiction to negotiate what the public is, interest is at a, at a certain time. And that makes this concept very flexible and robust and gives our societies uh, a start that, um, because we've actually already managed in many ways uh, to define a public interest for a certain problem and for a certain time. And with that, I wanna uh, jump into uh, some thoughts some general thoughts uh, on the next slide. Yeah, I'm not sharing the slides myself. It didn't work, so we <laughs> I have a little help. Um, thanks again for this. Um, and yeah, just a few thoughts on what levels of 
digital infrastructure and public interest we have today. And I think the first level um, was already mentioned. It's, it's still the level of access. <laughs> Uh, and even in Germany, that is still a debate, like that people don't have the same uh, possibilities and access to the internet and to certain uh, technologies. Um, on the second level, I think it's very much about the existing infrastructures um, that have become a public infrastructure, but I would claim that they're, they're not always in the public interest. They're very, mu very much driven by private interests. And those are kind of uh, the competing opponent to the public interests that we um, that we share in a society. Um, and I think right now to preserve public interest in these infrastructure, it's very much of a, about enforcing existing rights and existing values. And and yeah, uh, governments are doing better or worse. <laughs> we see a, a, in a, on a global on a global map. Uh, but I think it's one of the most important challenges that we have right now to navigate the existing infrastructures that we will not be able to fully exchange or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, or rebuild. Um, to navigate those into, um, um, yeah, a, a new structure that is more fit for our democratic needs and our democratic values. But the third level, I think, is one that the internet has kind of provided from, from the start uh, to encourage also civil society and all kinds of different actors to become a part of building and reimagining a new ecosystem where the public interest is more at core uh, of the technologies than it is with the more privately driven, industry driven technologies that emerge. And I think uh, in many cities we see that there is a room for civic tech and there is a room for technologies that emerge in a different way. Uh, and in this uh, area, it's very often um, one thing to um, ensure that there is enough innovation and to encourage innovation, but it's another thing to ensure maintenance. And we see that many of the infrastructures that have emerged from civic tech and open source communities uh, have a huge issue of maintenance. Uh, because it is very unsexy in our world to fund a structure that is very old and needs just needs maintenance <laughs> and is not something shiny and new um, that people are building but it's all, very often also about that and in that uh, area i i would locate my work about uh, public interest ai where uh yeah a research group that is actually trying to find out what it means for the ai life cycle to be uh happening uh, with that idea of public interest at, at its core and it changes the whole pro process i can tell you how ai is made and how it's implemented and i will say a few things about that maybe but well, like one last thought about um this uh these three levels i think that education and digital education is actually also a part of that infrastructure in a way so to, to enable you people to to use their access, to navigate intermediaries, and to be able to actually participate uh, actively in building a digital infrastructure with, with a different vision. It's, it's such an important part on all these levels to have like education and literacy on all these levels. And so I think there is no public interest without education and without the possibility of participation. Um, on the next slide, uh, I kind of mapped out like shortly, what are the things that we are actually thinking about when we are talking about public interest AI or public interest tech more generally? And um, the first thing is justification. So there needs to be kind of a, a, um, a good uh, reason why we're actually using tech for a certain political issue, because very often there is kind of a solutionism around where we think that tech might be an answer, but actually we're dealing with a very political problem in the first place. So I think there it needs to be a lot of thinking about why and how technology can can solve uh, or help solve a problem in our society. The next one is that uh, it always needs to serve equality. And that goes back to a lot of political theories and also legal theories where equality can be kind of rooted as one core thing. If you want to serve the public interest, you've got to make sure that you at least don't hurt equality in your society. But in the best case, serve equality, so create more access or more uh, inclusiveness. 
And the next part, uh, and I think we, we learned that also from Richard uh, in, in practice in his example is deliberation and participatory design. So ask people, involve them. And there is a like a um, starting um, community to think about what methods we have to create active participation, because there's a lot of symbolic participation also around where people are asked but don't actually have impact um, and yeah this is a very interesting field of research and i think a, a very uh, important powerful field of emerging change uh, but also technical safeguards of course and um, in, in the end an openness for validation so in a way the possibility for advocates for very different rights groups to say what does this technology actually do is it safe is it doing the thing that it promises and to think of all these pillars in a way from the beginning, uh, we believe can be a very powerful uh, start to change how public interest technologies are made in the public sector, in uh, the field of civic engagement. Um, and that is something that we're also doing in practice. And that is just uh, like a short intro to two examples that we're working on on the next slide. So that, so that you just get an idea like what kind of direction we're thinking at. Uh, one project is using computer vision to actually um, identify accessibility features in public um, places and, and in the pictures that we have of public places. And with that, we want to provide more information for people who actually need, uh, need that information to be mobile in their uh, daily lives, so mainly wheelchair users, to navigate um, cities better. And we are work working with a, a map called Wheel Maps that provides that information already. And we're trying to, to help um, to make that more rich with machine learning, um, yeah, which can actually simple, simplify the process of identifying and integrating that information. And the other project is to translate German standard language into simple language, which is a quite complex task from a computer linguist perspective. And we hope to actually provide uh, tools that help with that task and also help end users with that task. So people who are actually using simple language. And there is a wide range of people who need a more simple language version to actually participate in our society. And so these are the things where we do believe that machine learning does have uh, something to offer in these very social issues, very political problems. Um, yeah, just to give you an idea in which directions we're working. And uh, yeah, we're at the same time trying to work on how to do this, how like about the process and the governance of doing uh, and um, creating public interest AI, but also doing something uh, like, yeah, producing something tangible that can be used in the end. This is uh, just a short insight on what we're researching and how we're researching. And I'm very happy yeah, to finish here and uh, be open for questions. Thank you so much, Teresa. Really inspiring. And I'm so kind of, yeah, so many, many good ideas and, and questions. And I'm happy we have a little bit of time now for questions. Uh, I have a few or I have many, but I will select a few. But I would also very much like the audiences at this point to kind of Think of questions, post them in the chat already if, if you have them, and I'll try as best to kind of moderate and, and kind of shift between uh, our conversations and also to the speakers, of course, ask questions of each other with these different backgrounds. I imagine you have kind of, there could be interesting uh, ideas uh, emerging. I want to kick off maybe with a question for, for all three of the, that is one that I'm very much concerned about, and I think from a media perspective is, but also from all these other perspectives is, is central. And I think Teresa hit it very well. I think all your presentations touched upon kind of the context, like the local context, understanding of the local context. And, and to some extent, and often I would argue, Facebook, YouTube, the big platforms failed because of lack of, of understanding of the local context. And that's ingrained in IMS's model is that that we work with local partners that understand local context, because in journalism that is proven over and over again, that's where the good solutions arise, right? But then when you move into technology, you have this dilemma between kind of local context and scale. Like so much about our conversations in tech is to scale and so much of the logic is to scale. And also when you do media development, a lot of talk about scale, if you can't, like if it stays too small, it doesn't have an impact, right? You want to achieve impact and that's of course related to scale. So either just to frame it to all three of you 
kind of your thoughts on, on that dilemma or and ideally if you have examples from from your research from your local work of, of kind of projects initiatives methodologies that are kind of addressing this this challenge of how do we tie solutions to the local context so they actually serve the public interest and are there elements we scale do we scale the whole thing like it's, it's a tough question but i hope uh, to have uh, have your perspectives on it and yeah to the rest of the audience please ask questions in the chat and i'll, uh, I'll attend to that as well and yeah i don't know richard are you up for oh Teresa, mark yeah i I, I, I can start maybe yes yeah, yeah. So, um i think i would question that idea that scale like really big scale is always necessary and good if you think or like something to start with when you think about public interest uh, infrastructure um i actually think like we like actually we have the the possibility to not start from that idea to provide something for a global market um but it can be a local solution and like to give maybe um one example in germany um i i um, wrote a report about civic engagement and how it changed with digitization in the last years for the german government and there was, uh, for instance, um, a platform that emerged that was, uh, like, I think only working in Germany to match uh, civic engaging people that wanted to do something with a possibility to get engaged. And that engagement was sometimes digital, it was sometimes in a, in a physical place. And um, they provided a platform. And now speaking about scale, what they did is they adapted the platform for um, uh, for customers' um, needs. So, for instance, for uh, an organization that actually wanted to have a very organization-wide civic engagement. Uh, and so they could actually use that same platform for different purposes, but it still um, didn't start from the idea that they actually need to create a one-fit-all solution. But what they did in Germany is they actually provided a very, very um, intimate service. They needed to talk a lot to people. They had a, had a very close relation to the people on their platform and a very different approach to managing uh, conversations uh, for that community. So um, yeah, they kind of emphasized how much actual work uh, into communication they needed to uh, invest. And um, so for me, it's a good alternative uh, example how platforms can can work do have a business model on one side, but don't have this idea of creating a one fit all solution for the whole wide world, but maybe creating something that can be adopted in very different ways in very different uh, settings. Thank you. Yeah. Richard, do you want to jump in? Or, or maybe I, yeah, no, Absolutely. putting us, yes. No, I'm good. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, very often we we tend to think of scale as we confuse scale with mass. And I think um, they aren't possibly the same thing, right? Scale is the exciting thing about digital media or, or digital systems or perhaps even governments. I think it's, um, you know, digital media, attention is the currency of digital media, right? And I think utility is influence in that attention economy. So very often when we talk about people, you know, much like Teresa was talking about, uh, you know, how people use a city, it comes down to usability. How do I use this institution or this city or this, how does it meet my specific needs as a differently abled person, as a person who speaks different languages? or perhaps the same language, but at different levels. And perhaps it's time we realize that the internet, actually, digital worlds favor niche, not mass, because we're able to find validity and acknowledgement and, and, and utility and relevance based on our interests. And it'd be awesome if governments and public infrastructure was then created for that niche need. Thank you so much. And, and Nadim, maybe you can of course answer to that, but also your specific example of, of PayPal discriminating. I, I think from an infrastructure perspective, that's so spot on. How, 
like so related to this, that becomes a very context specific problem from a very kind of scaled solution. Have you seen in that uh, what are people doing to kind of counter it? What are there any kind of emerging alternatives or and if you don't have that, of course, just just speaking in general terms. But I, I just see, see that one is so specific to how our globally scaled solution fails our, our local context. Yes, um, maybe just bef before that uh, to say generally about like uh, from global to local and scaling. Uh, I mean, we can also look at it from uh, the, the perspective of uh, social media companies and how, uh, for example, is working globally and in different languages and different contexts. And then come so many questions around the uh, content moderation uh, policies and uh, who designed them. And I can speak about the Arabic example for uh, the Arabic language example uh, and how this language is being dealt with because. Um, even that um, the, the third language is one, um, there are so many dialects that are very different. And uh, in many cases, for Facebook, for example, to hire a subcontracting company in Morocco to deal with a content uh, moderation that includes uh, dialects from uh, Palestinian, Syrian, Jordanian, Gulf, uh, which is basically a kind of a different language. So not to understand that there are very different nuances and different dialects and the people who are doing the content moderation in one country are not really understanding the jokes or the political part of it or the nuances. Um, so that's also uh, very problematic. And then as a, a social media company, you want to work everywhere and you don't want to. And when we speak with them, OK, we don't have enough people. We don't enough have. But, but yeah, then you have responsibility. You are working everywhere. So uh, you, you need to have enough manpower and enough solutions uh, to do the content uh, moderation in a, in a good way and uh, in a way that you, you are respecting also the people that you have on your platform and not just to scale in a way that you you, you have somebody uh, and to say also like what we know in the crisis in, in Myanmar that they said that didn't have enough people doing this content moderation who understand the language on other end. So that, that's your responsibility as a company. You want to scale up, you want to work in that country, you will need people who speak that language uh, and not just enough to say, I don't have enough manpower or enough people who know that language. Uh, and, and then crisis and disasters happen. Um, um, so, so that's in that issue. And on the second uh, level is also the, the whole issue of PayPal. Uh, so PayPal, they work in 200 countries. Um, but they do not operate in 30 others, including uh, Palestine as one of them. And uh, in many cases, it's not really clear like how uh, this uh, scaling is happening, how you decide in which countries you don't. Uh, so they say basically in places that you have a uh, political and uh, economic unrest, we would not. Uh, uh, so from one hand, they do not work in, in Palestine, but they do work in uh, Somalia and in Yemen. Um, uh, which I think uh, are uh, in the levels of unrest uh, uh, have a deep, deeper crisis. So, so again, like how these decisions are being taken. And uh, when you look at PayPal, PayPal is uh, such a huge company that so many millions of people are relying on. Even if you go to the competitors, they are much like Stripe or others, they are much smaller. And uh, that means that as a person, you can also be in it's a kind of monopoly, a monopoly. I mean, on, on this aspect, and, and and from there the problem starts. That difficulty, you cannot really uh, solve the solution with uh, much smaller competitors. Thank you so much. Very well. And then, yeah, audiences, if there's any questions, please uh, mark them in the chat. We're running out of time. We only have five minutes left, but I am very glad that I get to kind of get one more question in on. Uh, on coalitions, as I see one of the answers to, to this kind of context specific versus scale discussion or, or like however you, you frame it, is that when you face a specific challenge in Palestine or in Myanmar, as, as one of our partners told me, like he sees it as Facebook will change pretty quickly in, in the US if they have make a mistake because there's both kind of economic incentive and the legal incentive. It is in their jurisdiction, like they can change the law. Then they will subsequently change in, in Europe, Australia, kind of because of the economic push of, of consumers. And then they will basically ignore for as long as they can the rest 
who, who doesn't have that ability to move money in the same sense uh, as kind of a, a European context or an Australian context. From that, I thought, and this is not new, but coalitions of people that understand the local context, but then can generalize to a global level so we can get the attentions, both of the tech companies, but I th think increasingly regulation wise, like the EU and other kind of political power centers that, that, that has that power because we're so, so challenged. Have you seen existing coalitions that are kind of driving this? Of course, there's digital rights organizations, but maybe in particular to kind of towards the per public interest and spanning the different kind of uh, kind of um, professions and interest in this. So uh, we, of course, come from a very specific interest in journalism and see journalism and public interest journalism as part of the solution, but in no way the whole solution. There needs to be many other forces involved and you can find like a local theater would have a strong interest in kind of a public interest infrastructure where they could have their conversations and you could see activists and you can see academia and you can see all kind of institutions have this fundamental assumptions that we have a public square to talk in the digital space, but we might not. And right now we're kind of fractionized in many of us in that sense up against a big company like Facebook or like PayPal who then just makes one decision that affects all of us. So, so this is kind of, your perspective, both for local coalitions and global coalitions, have you seen any, or or, or where do, where do you see that moving, and is that part of the answer? So, a big thing to give you a few minutes to answer, but I hope you're you're up for it. Um, yeah, Nadim. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, working with the digital, the global digital rights community, I mean, we see that position um, uh, in many places. The, the kind of uh, stuck with, with this. I mean, we, we have the local uh, coalitions. We are trying to uh, mainstream uh, the whole digital rights issue. And I think people are finally more and more are aware of it because before we were kind of speaking uh, in a language that uh, the public space was not very aware of. But because of uh, the takedown for policies of uh, content moderation, uh, blocking, uh, I mean, the whole issue of uh, either uh, not allowing access to certain platforms or deplatforming in, in certain cases. So there is, a, at least on the local level, more and more uh, interest in this. Um, and we think that it's very important actually to move things and to change policies is basically the global coalitions because honestly, like uh, from a small organization and a certain very uh, Certain uh, country, it's very difficult to to influence these huge companies' policies uh, without having a, a global strong coalitions that can really push uh, things. This would be uh, almost uh, has no chance to to make the change. Thank you, Nadim. Shadow Sarasa, and I hope everyone's okay with running a few minutes over time, but we will end it very soon. I wanted to jump in quickly, if I may, uh, and and. And wonder if, you know, I respect that you're asking about communities and coalitions, but I wonder if it might be interesting to, to jump in and co-opt big tech, you know, and, and perhaps, you know, rather than give them power and then form coalitions that are breakaway groups that then, you know, tackle them. I wonder if there's an option to start thinking about how to co-opt uh, for example, Google. Google does systems well, right? And when they started to introduce, you know, stuff like usability, uh, they said, you know, we need page speed insights, and that will allow you to test how quickly your website loads. Uh, they did that because that's what users wanted, but it also made their business better, right? So it was a carrot and stick thing. Then they introduced a mobile mobile friendly test, you know. We're going to penalize people whose websites don't work on mobile screens, but we're going to promote people where you have great responsive uh, mobile websites. I wonder if there's a possibility to actually co-opt that systemic way of thinking, because let's face it, these are larger coalitions and communities than any government can possibly, could possibly have, uh, and introduce a system of responsibility design, for example. Or, or you know, public infrastructure design. It's been done before. Uh, I, I wonder if it could be done again. Thank you, Richard. And then final words from you, Teresa, and then I'll close it off. 
Yeah, I'll try to be quick because I think it's a very, very complex and big question that you're raising. And my short answer is that I do see many actors that have their own vision about what a public interest infrastructure might be. And the big players like Google and Facebook definitely are some that have one. I think more and more governments are waking up to, to come to a, a different version that they imagine, not yet knowing how they're actually going to support or build that. But what I'm missing, and that is my biggest point, is that uh, I think that civil society advocates and actors are still so much underrepresented in presenting their vision. And I think they need to be empowered the most to have a conversation and a powerful seat uh, in these conversations about what, pu what uh, public interest, interest infrastructures actually are. Uh, because I think, yeah, it's a, definitely an idea that needs to be negotiated. And I think they, they should be empowered much more than they actually are to this point. What a wonderful point to end with. I think uh, as civil society coming together here, we also have some government representatives in the, in the room. I'm very pleased. Uh, so I want to thank you speakers for, for delivering this so much food for thought. I could go on for hours and I will with many of you. This is from IMS perspective, just early stages. We are doing a report on some of this. We are, of course, very much involved with with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Tech for Democracy. So I would encourage you to be part of these ongoing debates this whole week. And then on uh, on November 18th, there's a high level conference with ministers and, and some really interesting speakers, including uh, Maria Reza, a Nobel Prize winning journalist who's at the forefront of some of this and taking it on from a journalistic perspective. So we're huge fans and very excited to have her part of it. And then this is a, a year of action is the way it's framed from the minister's side. So we are going to be engaged in this at multiple levels and also outside of what the ministry is is framing. This is a core issue for MS and for journalists around the world and for media organizations. And as we've talked about broader communities, so we're really into like where can journalism contribute? Where are our limited limits and, and who do we engage with further? So I would encourage everyone to kind of stay connected reach out to me if you have specific ideas or projects you're working on that are relevant and and i'm sure the speakers would also be more than happy to kind of connect and then i finally want to thank global focus who's the umbrella organization behind the whole kind of operations here that that made us all come together today so big thanks to to the to everyone at Global Focus, Benjamin is here in the room and you've done an amazing job in, in bringing us together. So, so thank you so much, everybody. I've really enjoyed this. I have a lot of ideas to carry on with and I look forward to continuing the conversations and importantly, the work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Linus. Thanks. Bye, bye. Bye. Thanks, Linus.